Uh, my name is Doug Robertson, and I'm the Dean of undergrad Undergraduate Education, and I'm very, very pleased that you're all here. Um, I wanted to say a word before we get started with our guest um, about the Common Reading Program that you all participated in. It's a remarkable program uh, where all of us entering the university all read the same book and uh, talk about it and becomes a, a cause, uh, it's a common experience here at the university and we're very, very pleased that you were participating in it and we hope that you got a lot out of it. Now it's my pleasure to introduce to you Firuze Dumas. Um, she was born in Abadan, uh, Iran. In the 1970s, she moved to Southern California with her family and she later attended UC Berkeley where she met and married a Frenchman. It just says a Frenchman, but it's a very special Frenchman, right? <laughs> um, she's written two memoirs, Funny and Farsi, which you read, and Laughing Without an Accent, the more recent one, which I hope you'll go out and buy. Um, Faruse grew up listening to her father, a former Fulbright scholar, recount the many colorful stories in both Iran and in America. In 2001, I find this very remarkable, with no prior writing experience, Faruse decided to write her stories as a gift to her two children, which became the book you read. That's a pretty good first time out. <laughs> I'm impressed. Um, Funny and Farce was on the, the uh, San Francisco Chronicle and the Los Angeles Times bestseller list and was a finalist for the Penn USA Award in 2004. That's a big deal and a finalist in 2005 for an Audio Award for the best audio book where she lost out to Bob Dylan. I just wish I could lose out to Bob Dylan. Uh, I would be honored. She was also a finalist for the prestigious Thurber Prize. That's a really big deal uh, for American humor. And she lost to John Stewart of The Daily Show. <laughs> She's due. <laughs> She's definitely due. Well, thank you for that welcome. My name is Firuze Dumas, and I came to this country in 1972 from Abadan, Iran. My father was an engineer with the National Iranian Oil Company, and he was given a two-year assignment to come to America to help an American company build a refinery in Iran. So all of a sudden, we found ourselves in Whittier, California. Now, at the time, my name was Firuze Jazairi. That's F-I-R-O-O-Z-E-H-J-A-Z-A-Y-E-R-I. So you could definitely tell that we were from somewhere else. And people were always asking us where we're from. So we'd say, Iran. And they'd say, where is that? And we'd say, well, it's right between Iraq and Afghanistan. And they'd say, where is that? And we'd say, OK, you know where the Caspian Sea is, where that really famous caviar comes from? We're to the south. And they'd say, what's caviar? <laughs> and I'll tell you, that fish egg conversation is always a dead end. So it just got to the point where we'd say, you know where Russia and Japan are? We're in the neighborhood. <laughs> and one time we had this elderly neighbor, and she came over, and she said, I just have to tell you people, I love your cats. And we said, we don't have any cats. And she said, no, the cat's in your country. And we said, well, the cat's in our country are just like the cat's in your country. And she said, no, they're not. And so she went back home, and she came back with this book, and she showed us a picture of this beautiful, long-haired creature, which we had never seen in our entire lives. And she said, it's a Persian cat. I think it's like Russian salad dressing. So from then on, whenever we would introduce ourselves, we'd say, we're from Iran, where Persian cats come from. I mean, mothers pretty much always say the same things. You know, nagging is nagging, different languages, same thing. You know, we all have a little strange uncle here and there. It's just, there's just a lot of, a lot of commonalities. And I, and I wanted my children to never be afraid if they met someone from a different country or a different, you know, religion or someone with a different skin color. And when I grew up, when I, when I became an adult, I was really shocked to find people who actually are very intimidated by people from other countries. So, now I had never written before. And I had been a stay-at-home mom for eight years. So when my then youngest, I now have three kids, but when my then youngest started kindergarten, I joined a writer's group. And it was the first time I was going to have any time to myself because I'd been you know, stay-at-home mom for eight years. I had a kid Velcro to my hip at all times. And I remember that first day of kindergarten because I was the only mom not crying. So <laughs> I joined this writer's group. 
And we met every Wednesday morning from 9 to 11.30. And there was about 22 people in the group, and the average age was about 75. Because when you think about it, who has time on a Wednesday morning, 9 to 11.30? It was, it was all retired people and me. And so I felt very intimidated because I thought, who am I to be writing my life stories when I am sitting next to a gentleman who has served in World War II? So it took me a while to get the courage. But the, the first story that I wrote was about the first time I went to summer camp. And the reason I started, <laughs> I did bathe this morning, okay. Um, <laughs> And the first, the reason I started with that story is because a few years before I joined the writers group, I asked my husband one day, I said, did I ever tell you about the first time I went to camp? And he said, no. And so I told him the story. And for those of you who have not read Finding in Farsi, what happened is I was 12 years old and I heard the kids at school talking about camp. And I didn't know what it was, but it sounded terribly exotic. So I went home and I told my parents, I said, I want to go to camp. And they didn't know what it was. And they said, okay, go. And now I have to explain, I, there's two types of immigrant parents, okay? There's the overly protective kind that won't let you watch the love boat because it's bad morals. And then, and then there's my parents who had total faith in the American culture. They were very detached from the American culture. And they, they just kept saying, you know, we want you to experience whatever American kids are experiencing. Yeah, very detached from this culture. <laughs> Luckily for them, I have a good head on my shoulders, but, and that is not the kind of parent that I am, I assure you. So... They immediately said to my brother, Fashid, the same brother, they said, Fashid, Firuze wants to go to something called camp. And he said, okay. So he found a camp for me. It was for two weeks, and it was eight hours away from our house. So I think he would have found something longer if he could have. But So next thing I know, I am on a bus going up to the mountains. And I'll tell you, the minute I was on that bus, I thought, oh, God, bad decision, bad decision. But it was too late. So eight hours later, I arrive in the mountains in this lodge it's a two-story lodge, and the top floor is for girls, and the bottom floor is for boys. And when they were giving me a tour, when we get to the bathroom, there was something I'd never seen in my entire life. Instead of just having regular showers, they just had a row of shower heads. And I remember thinking, am I the only one noticing that these shower walls and doors are missing? <laughs> but I was very shy, very, very shy as a, as a kid, and I thought, I'm not going to say anything. I don't want to draw any attention to myself. Here I am on a stage. But... <laughs> You know, people change. So I just thought, you know what? I'm just not going to bathe. And so I didn't bathe for two weeks. I also made no friends at camp. And uh, <laughs> later on, I did put those two facts together. But so anyways, I'm telling this story to my husband. And he was laughing so hard, he was crying. And I said to him, I said, Francois, you're being really insensitive and rude. And he said, he said, no, I swear, this is the funniest story I've ever heard. And, you know, I had never shared that incident with anyone. I mean, I went to camp, and then I blocked it off. I never talked about it. And so this light bulb went on in my head, and I thought, well, sometimes if you give something like 30 years, it can actually be kind of funny if nobody was hurt. And so that was the first story. <laughs> that was the first story that I wrote for my writer's group. And the way the group worked was that you would read a story out loud, and then everybody was supposed to critique it. So every time I would read one of my stories, they'd all raise their hands, and I'd call them, and they'd say, oh, that reminds me. When I was 14, I went to baseball camp with my friend Louis, and then I'd hear all about baseball camp. And then I remember reading a story about my uncle Nematola, and they all raised their hands. They said, oh, your uncle Nematola, just like my Aunt Stella. <laughs> I heard all about Aunt Stella. Uh, 